Welcome to Christ Community Church. Pastored by Dr. Carly King Sr. and Dr. Jean Porter King, where we are the community within a community of faith. Please turn your attention to the word provided by Dr. King. Hallelujah. I've been deeply impacted by a book. I haven't read the whole book yet, but just started on it. It was in my wife's library, given to her from a friend of hers. It's by uh, Song Chan Ra. I believe I'm pronouncing his name correct. It's called Prophetic Lament. Prophetic Lament. And I don't know about you, and I'll talk about that, what it means in lamenting, but I am bothered by things that are going on around us. And sometimes there's so much that's going on around us that we are not, we're almost oblivious to it. We're almost anesthetized. We're almost deadened because it's just so much and it's almost an overload. But when I just think about the things that people have to face, whether the saved or the unsaved, and when I think about politically how a mess things are, a mess, how this country is continually embarrassed, when I think about our politicians that uh, are fighting more about being reelected than uh, for the needs of the, of the needy. When I think about our school systems that are in disrepair, when I think about our communities, when I think about marriages, when I think about families that are falling apart, when I think about churches that are failing, And so, I'm always trying to figure out how to uh, do something better or to get better or to provide services. As a matter of fact, uh, my wife and I are, I guess we call it semi-world travelers. Um, and whenever we're out of the country, I'm always looking at uh, where we are, that country, through almost two lenses. I'm looking at things from a spiritual perspective, and so whether we were in India and I was looking for the cows that were, and I saw one bull on the side of the road, sacred, and we didn't have, uh, I don't think I saw any McDonald's in uh, India, but you didn't have any beef in India, because uh, the cow is sacred. But, but I look at things from a spiritual eye or spiritual lens, but I also look at things from an economic and community, or community and economic lens. And I'm looking at uh, what are we missing over here when we were in um, the United Arab Emirates um, and the, the, the glamour in Dubai, the glamour, the glitz, of the expansion, the buildings, the beauty, the opulence. And I'm thinking, here, Lord, these folk are over in a desert. And, but yet they're the seed of Ishmael and so they're blessed. But, but as I'm looking at the commerce and I'm saying, Lord, I'm thinking about my community. I was just in Ultra on yesterday over here in Lansing and it kind of surprised me. I forgot they're closing the store. But when you go in and most of the bins or most of the shelves are gone. And so it's like, well, maybe I shouldn't even be shopping. But I, I mourn a bit. I mourn, I, and I, I wish that there was something that, uh, something more I could do. I, I lament, if you will, and uh, is there somebody that can help me in uh, making some sense out of it? And I think uh, we stumbled upon something, and it was in the book of Lamentations. It was really uh, given to me from that book, Prophet or Prophetic Lament. So in the book of Lamentations, and we'll talk about what it means to lament, but in that book, in the third chapter, and I'm going to ask you to find it, it's going to be on the screen in a second, the third chapter of Lamentations, and we're going to pick up at verse 19, and I'm going to ask that you stand as we read through those verses. 
Lamentations 3, beginning at verse 19. If you don't have a Bible, it's on the screen. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I think Jeremiah is on to something. This book is called by some the book of lamentations by Jeremiah or Jeremiah's book of lamentations and he is grieving grieving over Jerusalem this is an older book but uh, just and we have some of you who are in the school of ministry and uh, but but all of you are Bible students or scholars and so I want to give you several uh, just one main point when you're looking at the Bible you want to look and be informed from or by its biblical sense, put that on the screen, and by its cultural significance. Its biblical sense, write it down, it means what does this particular book mean? So we're in the book of Lamentations, and we'll talk about what it means. And then the cultural significance, what does it have to say to us in our particular setting? And so. It's unfortunate that we're in a time of biblical illiteracy. Most people are illiterate. They do not read the Bible or understand what they're reading or spend enough time going beyond what is on the surface, so digging in the text. And so because of biblical illiteracy, people will go not recognizing that whatever ails you, whatever problems you have, the answer is right in the book. It's in the Bible. But people are now going to every other source and actually shelving the Bible. One brother uh, tickled me and I asked, did you have a Bible? They had a Bible, but it was the big family Bible, but not a Bible where they could read and study and carry with them. But now that we have Bibles on our cell phones and our iPads, uh, let's use them, amen? Uh, in this text, Jeremiah is, it's really a soliloquy, it's, it's his lament, his, it's not just a complaint, his mourning, his grief over what has happened to Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been stripped of all of its previous glory and it is in shambles. Jerusalem is in a mess and Jeremiah grieves. That's the biblical sense. Cultural significance, Jerusalem can be like our America in a mess, being stripped, not stripped yet, but being stripped of its previous glory and the direction that we're going almost in shambles. And so here, Jerusalem is a mess, Jeremiah grieves, we're in a mess, and we ought to grieve. And I want to give you permission. Sometimes we don't do enough biblical lamenting in the church. But I want to give you permission. I want you to give yourself, more importantly, permission to grieve, to come to church. Sometimes people don't even want to come to church because they... Uh, they don't want to bring their problems. No, no. If there's any place to come to bring your problems, it's right here in the church. Say in the church. And let me just tell you something else. Uh, when you come with your lamentations, you're not necessarily looking for uh, your neighbor. They might not have the answer. And, and sometimes we're and counseling, I think, is excellent. Uh, but the answer, and even sometimes God doesn't give us the answer. In the book of Job, 
it was never answered why the righteous suffer. Sometimes we're just going to have to go through some stuff. But what happens is in the midst of Job asking the question, but there was, if you will, this uncomfortability with those who were supposedly his friends with the suffering that Job was going through. Sometimes in the church we're uncomfortable when people are coming in with their problems and they're lamenting. Listen, I might be praising the Lord, but somebody else might be crying in lament. They're crying because the family is being broken up. They're crying because a house is being repossessed. They're crying because their job just ended. They're crying because they've run out of money. They're crying because the doctor just gave them a negative report. I cannot heal cancer. But I know somebody who can. And, and, and listen, but, 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 but his healing might be on this side or it might be on the but you come on, let's come on, let's, 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 whatever our situations. And so if there's praise, and, and this is what, I, even on last week as I was listening to the testimonies during the uh, district meeting and hearing how these individuals endured hardship, death, and disappointment. I listened to Mother Patterson who shared her testimony, powerful testimony. I listened to Sister Tanya Caldwell as she shared her testimony. Brother Ronald Williams, I listened to these young and old talk about how at points where they had to grieve or lament over life, life can be messy. Ah, let me just put it like this. Life from time to time is messy, amen? And so here in this text, Jeremiah is grieving, he's struggling, he's struggling. Uh, let me just kind of give you a, a few things about lamenting. Lamenting is important. Uh, in verse, if I started in just even the first chapter, just go there for the, uh, those who have their Bibles, and let me just kind of show you the picture that's going on and what Jeremiah is grieving over. He's talking about how lonely sits the city that was at one time full of people. How like a widow is she who was great among the nations. The princess among the provinces has become a slave. Wow. And so here for Two and a half chapters. Chapter one, you'll see it again in chapter two. Chapter two, start with verse one. How the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger. He has, he cast down from heaven the earth, the beauty of Israel, and did not remember his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up and has not pitied all the dwelling places of Jacob. Wow. By the time you're in the third chapter, verse 2, he has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Verse 3, surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. Verse 7, he has hedged me in so I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Verse 8, even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. Mm. So, he's lamenting. He's lamenting. Let me give you four things that, that uh, I was doing some work on. Steve and Joan Hung shared these benefits of lamenting. One, they say that it sanitizes your faith. It sanitizes your faith, meaning it, it makes you honest about what you believe. When you're uh, going through and you're in pain, when you're in agony, when you're grieving, uh, do you really believe that he's a way maker? When you're in pain and agony because of a sense of loss, do you really believe he's a deliverer? Do you really believe he's a healer? Or... Are you angry with him? Are you mad at him? So it sanitizes your faith. It cleans it up a bit. 
it positions you for healing. It positions you for healing. Only in honesty can you be open to healing if you're always in or continue to be in denial. But when things are bad and it's just bad and you're looking, uh, wondering, God, how are we going to get out of this? And then you, you're, your faith, you, you're saying, God, but I'm going to trust you. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So it positions you for healing. It leads to sacred sorrow. I like that term. Hung brought that up. Sacred sorrow, meaning it's a reminder that all creation, the Bible lets us know in the epistles, is groaning for restoration to God. The earth is groaning. Creation is groaning because of the impacts of sin. So there's this sacred sorrow. But fourthly, it deepens community through redemptive suffering. What does that mean? Is that people come into this sanctuary and sometimes we're worshiping next to a person who is in pain, knowing that they might not get an answer, but they will certainly get God. See, see sometimes the pain we're trying to always explain everything, but some things are just unexplainable. God is not going to, if you will, give you an answer so it's all nice and tidy, but he will say this, I'll never leave you. No, for a second. So sometimes we were walking with God at a distance, and God says, no, you're too far behind. I'm going to allow something to happen so that you kind of catch up. But pick up in this third chapter, verse 19. He says, remember my affliction and roaming the wormwood and the gall. Verse 20, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. By the time we're in verse 20, it seems almost as if the, the writer Jeremiah is about ready to give up. So have you ever been in that position where you're just throwing up your hand? Let me just uh, give you a little personal testimony. I, I struggled with um, really being open to lamenting or mourning. Uh, I remember my earliest um, morning it was when my grandfather had passed my mother's father and my mother's father was like he, he had such an impact on me that my office to this day is really somewhat set up like his office he was a pastor but he was also a businessman so when people would say what do you want to be when you grow up I was really tell them I'd be like, I want to be like my grandfather. I, I would say this, I want to be a businessman. I want to be a Christian, Christian businessman. My grandfather ran a taxi service, Norman Cab. He also owned several buildings. He had one time he owned a restaurant and then he built uh, the church. Uh, he was AME and he built an AME church in Gary. And um, so he was, he always was studying. And so my study, my office right now is almost, it's just a little larger and maybe has a couple more bookshelves, but it's really kind of set up like my grandfather. Now, uh, he didn't have a, uh, a computer, he had a typewriter, so he had his typewriter there. I got a computer. Uh, he didn't have a printer, he had a stenograph. Remember that? And some of you all maybe like the, the smell of the thing. Uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, his sermons, I'd run them off and, and uh, have them either on my uh, uh, paper or on my iPad. I still have copies of my grandfather's typed sermons in my office. When he died, it was like the world ended and I, I was experiencing such grief. 
grief. But then I, I don't know what happened. I just kind of shut it off. I kind of learned at an early age how to shut off pain. Um, but it wasn't just with my grandfather. Then later on, as I got older, even when I was going through school at Purdue and didn't see things turn out just like I wanted to turn out, and, and I, had, I was lamenting. I remember banging on the uh, piano at my parents' home, and, uh, but then I just pulled myself together and just shifted gears because I had to move on. When I lost my late wife, I, I couldn't really grieve like I wanted. On the day that she passed, I had to come here, and the congregation was here. And I stood down here just to share with them uh, the events, because she went in on a Friday, and she transitioned that Sunday. It was sudden. And for the kids and for the church, I, I was limited, I felt, in how long I could grieve. Grief. You know, I probably haven't been as uh, open to it, but the Lord really delivered me and let me know that it's all right to lament and to mourn and to grieve. There's nothing wrong with it. We need to give uh, people permission. We need to give ourselves permission. It's all right to cry. It's all right to have a little breakdown. It's all right to mourn. It's all right to be sad. And even when folk can't appreciate it, and one of the first things, one of the first mistakes people always try to do is to pull you out of your grief because really it's not so much sometimes because they want to help you, they're helping themselves. Because if they were trying to help you, then let you grieve. Let, let you feel the pain, the pain of loss and suffering. Jeremiah lamented. There's a value in lamenting. There's a value. And so let it, even when I'm thinking about Christ community, with people coming in, yes, I just sense that there's going to be a number of individuals that come in here who are tired of putting on a mask. See, see, a part of my masking it was I was also a PK. I was a preacher's kid. So we were trained to keep on a good face. It didn't matter what was going on in the house because sometimes people, members, would look at the children and see how the children are doing. And you know how children, children are honest pretty much. Well, as a PK, you were taught to Keep that face blank, put a smile on it, and nothing is happening. You see nothing, you hear nothing, you know nothing. And so I was taught probably at an early age to mask my feelings. But the Lord is saying, son, listen, it's all right. I want you to let my people know that if there's a time them to be real and real with me but real with themselves real with the church is right now because times are bad and there ought to be some genuine lamenting going on because I don't believe that God is pleased with what is going on and if God is not pleased I should not be pleased this is a time of lamenting come on Hallelujah. And so I need to be, as pastor, very sensitive. Yes, uh, you know, sometimes I'll declare that on Sundays, this is Celebration Sunday. Well, as long as we understand something, that both work together in tandem. 
that there will be mourning that's going on, and so people need to be free to come and be real. Tell your neighbor, I'm going to be real. As my wife would say uh, in one of her sermons, uh, and you could say, take the mask off. Tell your other neighbor, take the mask off. Ah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a freedom in being who you are. Yeah, we dress up, all of us kind of, we dress up nice, don't we? Look nice and smell nice, but this, all this stuff, this pain and this heartache, this suffering, this hurt, disenchanted, disgusted, disgrace. Mm. Lamenting. But thank the Lord that it doesn't stop there. I believe that we need to do that lamentation or lamenting, but by the time we're in verse 21, it's almost as if it's an interruption in the lamenting. It stops with this. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. I have hope. So there's this list of negatives for almost two and a half chapters, but hallelujah, by the time I get to that verse 21, and so if you will, I, I took a little something out of a verse, he says, I still remember, and then he verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse 21, this I recall, so I decided to make a, an acronym out of recall, and uh, we're going to put it up there on, on the board. Recall. So I, I do want to move from uh, just only lamenting. So there's a time for lamenting, and, and maybe sometimes you have to inform some folk that when they come and they, they might want to say, how come you're not happy? Because I'm lamenting. Well, it couldn't be all that bad. It's bad enough for me to feel bad, so leave me alone. If you're not going to embrace where I am, then please stop. All right, come on, give the Lord a praise. Stop it. I'm not putting on any, ma hallelujah, mask anymore. I'm going to be me. Jesus loves the real me, sees the real me, accepts the real me, and I am going to be just who the Lord made me to be. Hallelujah. But, 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 but then I, I, I can recall when I'm ready to shift gears, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. So recall, uh, remember is the first one. Remember under recall. Bring to your thoughts, recall, recall, recall. It means it's, it's this picture of these thoughts that go in your mind uh, about the goodness of God, but then they don't stay there. They go, and the enemy is always trying to give us other distractions and put other things in our mind, in our spirit, uh, get our attention. Uh, whether it's thoughts, whether we see something on the tube or we see something in life, uh, in, on, in the news or on our uh, internet. Uh, but, but what happens is, and which will further want it to make us to stay in that uh, lamenting position. But as I recall, as I remember the past testimonies. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, last week was a interesting week. I had to, to talk with the banker, I had to talk with the accountant, and I had to talk to the attorney and just coordinate all these things. And uh, as I was going through, before uh, I talked to the banker, and I had already talked, and before even I talked to the attorney, I had talked to the accountant, and, and I wanted to start, and not only did I want, I began to lament. And it's like, Lord, here the church is trying to do whatever it's trying to do, just trying to move right along, and sometimes it's so gracious in doing things that it almost hurts itself. Then we make corrective uh, uh, responses, but Lord, here, why... Why, when we're trying to do, do we have to deal with so much stuff? 
And then the Lord just reminded me, but son, remember when you all were in a, a situation, it wasn't this situation, but you were in another situation, and you had to uh, work with that same group of people and know how I blessed, and I blessed, and I delivered, and I, I worked away, and I, I moved beyond all you could ask or think. Bring back to or remember the thoughts, the past testimonies of uh, how God intervened and how he's ever present right now. But R is under recall is remember. E is for encourage. Encourage. And so you'll find that in verse 21b where uh, recognize this. It's almost this, this uh, I'm reminded of David as the Bible says uh, here he had gone uh, to uh, the Philistine king and, and, and he didn't want to fight the Israelites but it looked like he was going to have to but the generals of the Philistines said no we don't want that David with us so David's on his way back uh, to his place and as he's going back he sees smoke coming up and he has left with he's been with his army and they left the children and women back when they come back, they see that the, their camp has been raided by another enemy. And the Bible, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the Bible tells us that the men were so upset with David, they talked about stoning him to death. And the Bible says that David strengthened himself in the Lord. And so we've got to learn how to encourage ourselves and uh, uh, just remember the, the promises of God and, and know that, listen, uh, it doesn't matter how bad the situation, it doesn't matter what series of challenges are before him, he's not only, watch this, he's not only working it out, the Bible lets me know he's working it out for our good. And so it doesn't matter whatever the weapon is that the enemy brings against us, I, it doesn't matter. God is still working it all out for our good. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. So I'm bringing back past testimonies. I'm bringing back the word of God. I'm bringing back my understanding of an ever-present God. I'm remembering that. And then I encourage myself that he's working it out. And then I begin to, now that's something to shout about. I begin to celebrate, celebrate. Verse 22. It says, though the Lord's mercies, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions, what? fail not so I'm celebrating I'm celebrating that his compassion it doesn't matter uh, uh, what's going on God and doesn't matter how far I think he is from me but his compassion hallelujah fail not huh the a under recall is acknowledge you'll acknowledge uh, in verse 24 it says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is my portion. What's so powerful about the Lord being your portion and under acknowledgement, it's not your supervisor that's your portion. And so a supervisor might have made a move or, or determined, listen, uh, this company is moving on, but it's going to move on without you. Your supervisor is not your portion. Uh, it, it doesn't matter about your doctor. Your doctor's not your portion. It doesn't matter. Your accountant is not your portion. None of these things. Your, your spouse is not your portion. But I thank the Lord. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. So I acknowledge that it's God that's going to work this thing out. And the Lord of hosts who's going to move on our behalf. And so verse 24 it says that latter part, therefore I hope in him. So I laud him as the, the elf under recall. So I remember, I encourage, I celebrate, I acknowledge, I laud him. I praise God through Jesus Christ. Therefore I have hope in him. And you'll see it again in verse 26. But then in verse uh, 25 and 26 under recall, I remember, I encourage, I celebrate, I acknowledge, I laud, and then I lean on him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. 
So I, I sense the Lord is saying, I want you to go ahead and be in touch with your feeling. And so there's times in which uh, I need to mourn. And even as I'm looking at uh, this text, and Jeremiah was concerned about Jerusalem and the, the role of Jerusalem being, if you will, that spiritual capital, if you will, I'm concerned about the church. We are almost two generations from uh, the church being dysfunctional. When you think about the people, the children, I don't sense that, one, there's enough training and development, and the, the children have disassociated, many of them, the youth. When you look at the mainstream, many churches are not really in working on incorporating youth in that church. So I used to make this statement. I think it's still true. Anytime there's a church that over 50% of the church who is over 50, over 50% of the church is over 50, you have a dying church. I'm going to say that again. When you go into a church and the majority of the folk are over 50, it's a dying church. And so we've got to, in some kind of way, reach out and incorporate. But as you're looking at the disturbing pictures, the church being a few generations away from extension, extension but and so I mourn or I lament, but I've got hope. Doesn't it say that? Therefore, verse 24, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. Hmm. Our communities are slowly declining and economic development is not fairly being dispersed throughout these communities, throughout, uh, throughout our neighborhoods. I'm looking at the school systems that we have in place, and it's almost shameful, but I've got hope in him. The poor are being, if you will, portrayed by our politicians as being the enemy. Well, the poor and us have a whole lot more in common Come on, talk back to me. Matter of fact, most folk, too many of us, are only a few paychecks away from. But in the midst of the poor being identified as the enemy or the problem, but I've got my hope in him. When I think about our global economy and our children who are not being prepared to function and excel on a global level, but I've got in him when our physical health issues are out of sync and they're out of whack when i think about the diabetes and the 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 the, the hypertension and uh, all of the things that the, the cancer all of the things that are ravaging through our communities but i've got hope hallelujah in him when i think about not only our, our, our health challenges before us, but I think about even being able to afford health care. But I've got hope, hallelujah, in him. When I uh, think about some of the problems of our youth where they're cutting themselves and cutting up and crashing and messing up, but great is thy faithfulness and therefore I've got hope in him. When I think about, really, I believe that we are in the last days. These are some scary times, but I've got hope in him. These are the end times. So I, I sense that there's this lamenting that needs to happen. We, we need to be bothered. Not just about, and sometimes our condition helps us to be sensitive to other conditions. Our pain helps us to be sensitive to the pains of others. And so we should never, when we start with our pain, let it in with us. But we go beyond us and we recognize that my brother is suffering, my sister is suffering, and maybe through my suffering I can lend a hand or be a, a sense of support. I, I sense the Lord is challenging us to do the lamenting that ought to be going on in the church, but also celebration ought to be there too as well amen come on somebody give the Lord a praise because in verse 23 and we'll close out with this he's telling us that the Lord's mercies are new 
every morning. Every morning. Listen, yes, I can lament it, but in my pain, in my struggle, recognize that I've got a mercy, a merciful God who has provided mercy for me on this day. And the kindness that God has or distributing to me or extending to me on this day will be able to help me to get through whatever I'm lamenting about. The Lord, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fill not. They are new every morning. And then this, great is your faithfulness. Now, 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 the sermon is this faithfulness of God. It's, it's not just that God is faithful, but he's great in his faithfulness. I, I, just being faithful is just enough. But for God saying, listen, but not only am I faithful, but I, I want, in, in times that you see me, I'm faithful. In times that you don't see me, I'm faithful. Listen, there's nothing about your situations that surprise me. There's nothing that catches me off guard. Great is my faith because I've already, I see the end, I see the beginning, and I know where you are, and I will extend mercy to you, whatever mercy. So if you got to lament or cry, and if that brings you closer, you're looking for answers, I might not give you an answer, but I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be there, right there with you, extending mercy and kindness, even there. And when you switch gears and you recognize that in spite of whatever I'm going through, God is still good, and he's good all the time. And great is your faithfulness. If it had not been for your faithfulness, I would have been consumed. But Lord, I'm still here. The enemy had in his mind to destroy me. The enemy had in his mind to wipe me out. But God, great is your faithfulness faithfulness even when I have not been faithful great has been your faithfulness even when I have not been dependable but great is your faithfulness great everybody standing great is your faithfulness hallelujah great Lord we thank you Lord I thank you that I can be real I can be who you created me to be. And God, in my realness, and this is the thing, in my lamenting, there's no perfect way of lamenting. Lamenting is sloppy. Lamenting is messy. And so sometimes as people come into this place, are we giving them permission? Listen, go ahead and lament. We know that uh, we, we wish we had a formula, cookie cutter, we could just take care of, but we recognize that you have to have time because we had to have time ourselves. I had to be honest with myself. I had to be honest about my faith. I had to be honest about God, do I see you as my friend? Do I see you as a lover of my soul? Do I see, can I trust you, Lord? Can I lean on you, Lord? There are some things that shook me up, rattled me. And I had to be honest about my faith. But you know what? No matter what I've had to go through, I found this, that great is his faithfulness and because of that I have hope in him I have hope in him we're getting ready to go but for all you people who want to be real real there's some stuff and you don't need to tell me unless you want to tell me but I want you to tell Jesus. But if you're just saying, I, I'm making a statement, I'm, I'm being real, we're, we're, we're coming out of the facades. Pastor has preached so that the church is a safe place for me to be real. Amen. It's a safe place. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. So if you're wanting to 
come on down and we just pray with you, we just stand with you, mm -hmm. then I'm going to ask that you come down. And, 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 and as often as when we have these altar calls, listen, it's not just one time you get it and then you don't have to go back anymore, but we need to just learning, learn how to keep coming to the altar. Coming to the, it's, it's an humbling, it's an humbling time. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to join you. But if there's anyone who wants to come to the altar, I'm going to be at the altar. Thank you for joining our broadcast today. For additional information, please visit us on our website, our Facebook page, or Twitter.